quick. It shuts the recording off. It's, it's going to have to record, but not yet. Good morning, I'm Helen Arcantu and my pronouns are she, her. I am the proud CEO of the YWCA of Northern New Jersey and I'm here to welcome you to our Know Your Employee Rights Roundtable event. Our mission at the YWCA of Northern New Jersey is to eliminate racism, foster racial understanding and promote gender equity through advocacy and programming. And our service area includes Bergen, Essex, Passaic, Hudson, and Morris counties. Today's roundtable event has been convened to launch our employee rights campaign and introduce you to a free and easily accessible resource that has been developed by the YW. I would like to thank the New Jersey State Bar Foundation for their ongoing commitment to supporting systemic change and generously funding the grant that allowed the YWCA of Northern New Jersey to develop and launch this campaign. Our thanks to Kristen Brannigan, a managing partner of KS Brannigan Law and Beth Zoller, partner at KS Brannigan Law for their legal guidance in developing the Know Your Rights Employee Toolkit. Supporting women in the workplace is a key area of focus for the YWCA of Northern New Jersey and has been for more than a century. Although we've seen some very big changes in the roles of women in the workforce since we opened our doors 100 years ago, the need for us to advocate for gender equity has not changed at all over that time. Our goal for this initiative is to educate individuals, especially women and women of color, about their rights in the workplace, their workplace protections that are available to them, and their recourse if their workplace rights have been violated. Our distinguished guests today will help educate us on employee rights and the protections that are in place to support us. They are each expert areas in their own right, and they are committed to creating fair and safe workplaces in New Jersey. We will begin today's roundtable with opening comments from the New Jersey Office of the Attorney General Director of the New Jersey Division on Civil Rights, the Honorable Sundeep Ayer who oversees the state agency charged with protecting civil rights of all New Jerseyans. Since his appointment in January, 2023, he has spearheaded the dramatic expansion of the division's strategic enforcement efforts. Under his leadership, the division has initiated major systemic investigations and enforcement actions to combat housing discrimination, held institutions of public trust accountable for their violating civil rights, protected students from discrimination in school. He has also expanded the division's enforcement policy and outreach and public education to combat bias and hate across New Jersey. Please join me in welcoming the Honorable Sundeep Ayer. Thank you so much. Helen, uh, I'm so grateful to the YWCA for doing the work every single day to protect the civil rights of our state's residents. And this employee rights campaign, I think, is a testament to the power of what the YWCA of Northern New Jersey has been able to accomplish here in New Jersey. This is a groundbreaking resource that provides in easy to understand language for every resident of our state, their rights with respect to discrimination, harassment, retaliation, and equal pay. And this is a moment where those resources are critically important. I also wanna thank 
the New Jersey State Bar Foundation for their support of this really important work and for hosting us here today. In my capacity as the director of the New Jersey Division on Civil Rights, I'm charged with the enforcement of our state's anti-discrimination laws. And I am very fortunate to live in a state, and we all are fortunate to live in a state, where we've got some of the strongest civil rights laws in the entire country. Our law against discrimination was enacted in 1945, a full 19 years before the federal civil rights laws provided protections in the context of employment. And the law against discrimination prohibits discrimination in employment, in housing, in places of public accommodation, in credit, and in contracting. And those prohibitions extend to discrimination on the basis of a wide variety of protected characteristics. Those protected characteristics include race, gender, national origin, sexual orientation, religion, and disability, and much more. Those protections haven't just stayed constant since 1945. We've been doing a lot of work here in the state to continue to expand those protections over the last couple of years. And under Governor Murphy's leadership, we've enacted some of the strongest workplace protections in recent years in the entire country. For example, we've enacted a Pregnant Workers Fairness Act here in New Jersey that provides broad protection to individuals based on their pregnancy, based on breastfeeding. And we're one of the relatively few states in the country that expressly lists pregnancy and breastfeeding as protected characteristics under our law. We've also got one of the strongest equal pay statutes in the country. Now, under federal law, there is a guarantee of equal pay for equal work. And that guarantee applies so that individuals are not paid differently based on gender. In New Jersey, our protections are substantially broader than that. It's not just equal pay for equal work, it's equal pay for substantially similar work. Now, I know that may not sound like a big difference, but it actually makes an enormous difference in practice in terms of protecting the right to equal pay. And what's more, our equal pay statute applies not just to gender-based pay differentials, but pay differentials based on any of the protected characteristics under the New Jersey law against discrimination. So we've got really strong protections in place here in New Jersey. And the YWCA of Northern New Jersey's work through the Employee Rights Campaign is going to make a big difference in helping employees understand their rights. But good law without meaningful enforcement is not really anything more than just a press release. So that's why our division, the Division on Civil Rights, under the leadership of Attorney General Platkin, has been focused from day one on ensuring the enforcement of our state's strong anti-discrimination protections. And we do this not to make uh, employers or regulated entities the enemy, um, entities the enemy. In fact, our goal is to work in partnership with regulated entities, with employers, to make sure that they understand their obligations. But unfortunately, we've seen a number of examples in recent years where discrimination has reared its ugly head. And that's why this resource is so important. And I just wanna touch on a couple of examples of some of the enforcement work that the division has been doing in response to discrimination, retaliation, harassment, equal pay issues across our state. In June, the Division on Civil Rights and the Attorney General filed a complaint against Local 11, a labor union based out of Essex County. And what the complaint alleges is the stuff of 1854 and 1954, not 2024, unfortunately. What we allege in the complaint is that the union engaged in a systematic pattern and practice of creating a hostile work environment for its Black employees. Black union members were regularly subjected to racial epithets, racial slurs, the N-word, and the labor union took no action to address that hostile work environment. And what's more, not only was there a hostile work environment, 
but the union also discriminated in who got job assignments through the union's work, working calls. And so we documented over the course of a 14 month period, over 50 instances where black union members have been passed over for work, resulting in collectively over a year's worth of lost wages and lost work opportunities. Those allegations are extremely serious. And that's why we commenced an investigation and we ultimately filed a complaint in Superior Court in June in order to hold Local 11 accountable for these alleged actions. That's the discrimination side. We also see, unfortunately, sexual harassment regularly occur, far too regularly occur in our workplaces. To give you just one example, we recently issued a finding of probable cause against a grocery store located in Ocean County because there had been systematic sexual assault of a grocery store employee and the grocery store took no action to stop that harassment. Now, all employers across the state should know that when there is harassment of any kind, whether it's sexual harassment or harassment based on any other protected characteristic under our law, there is an obligation on the part of the employer to take actions that are reasonably calculated to end that harassment. And the grocery store failed to do that. But not only did it fail to do that, it then took retaliatory action against the employee who had reported the harassment. And so we continue to pursue enforcement action against that grocery store. Equal pay continues to be another enormous issue across our state. We know that women make 80 cents on the dollar, roughly, to white men. That actually, that statistic, usually applies only to white women. We know that Black women and Latina um, individuals in our state make 55 or 60 cents on the dollar compared to white men. So we've got a lot of work to do as a state to address equal pay. Our division has been committed to enforcement of our state's equal pay statute. And to give you just one example, we reached a consent order with AT&T, one of our state's largest employers, to address allegations of equal pay um, disparities that were occurring in the workplace at AT&T. And a big part of that resolution was requiring ongoing monitoring of AT&T's pay practices and requiring a pay study on the part of AT&T to ensure that these pay differentials won't continue into the future. The last very brief thing I want to mention, because I think it's on the emerging edge of uh, discrimination and anti-discrimination protection in our country, is algorithmic bias and algorithmic discrimination. Those sound like buzzwords, but the reality is that over 60% of employers in our state are using some form of AI or algorithm to conduct their hiring processes. Now, there's great potential. I don't want to downplay. There is great potential in the use of these technologies to improve hiring processes. But we also know that there are examples of discrimination that can either implicitly or explicitly occur as a use as a result of the use of this technology. And so all employers and all employees across the state need to be thinking about their rights, not just in their ordinary workplace interactions, but also in the use of algorithms by employers to decide things like who gets hired for a job, who gets a promotion in the workplace, who gets discipline in the workplace. Let me close with this critical point because there is an extraordinary amount of work to do as we've seen through some of our enforcement work, but we can't do any of that work alone. The work of protecting the civil rights of all of our residents isn't just a job for the Division on Civil Rights. It isn't just a job for the YWCA of Northern New Jersey. It's a job for employers to work in partnership with us. It's a responsibility also of every employee in the state to know their rights. And that's why interventions like the Employee Rights Campaign being run by the YWCA of Northern New Jersey are so critically important. They're being led by community-led, community-driven organizations. And that's how we're ultimately going to get the word out to people so that they understand their rights. When you do understand your rights, it's also critical that you know how to report violations. You can report violations to the EEOC, our federal counterparts, 
And you can also report violations to our division, the Division on Civil Rights, by going to bias.njcivilrights.gov. We take a look at every single one of those complaints. We take them extremely seriously. And where there's discrimination, we will take action to protect your rights. Thank you so much to the YWCA for hosting this incredible event, for putting together these incredible resources. I'm gonna turn the floor back over to Helen. Thank you so much for your ongoing efforts and daily commitment to protect the civil rights of every person in New Jersey. Um, I think after that opening, it's pretty clear why a toolkit like this is necessary. Um, but to give you just a greater sense and reinforce it further about why an employee rights campaign is needed and why a toolkit for navigating those violations is needed, I'd like to share some of the following with you. Um, research indicates that many employers do not make worse workplace harassment, do not take workplace harassment very seriously or take measures to prevent, investigate, or stop the behavior. We know that hourly workers and women in C-suite positions continue to experience harassment and discrimination. In fact, the research indicates that women executives face between 30 to 100% more harassment than other women workers. Additionally, discrimination and equal pay violations impact an even larger percentage of our employees. According to a 2023 Monster Job Poll, 91% of workers have experienced discrimination in the workplace and 77% have witnessed it. A 2023 Pew Research Center survey found that among black workers, 48% of men and 36% of women say that they've experienced discrimination just in the hiring practice, um, their pay and also their promotions. And a study led by AARP found that 61% of people aged 45 and older have experienced or witnessed age discrimination. And with all of this, we know that a big fear factor for employees and about reporting any type of unwanted behavior in the workplace is their fear of retaliation, which may occur when an employer punishes an employee for engaging in legally protected activity. Retaliation can manifest itself as a negative job action, such as a demotion, discipline, firing, salary reduction, or job or shift reassignment. So with that, um, before I introduce our esteemed panelist, for those of you that are watching us live on Facebook today, I'd like to let you know that we will be accepting questions at the end, um, if our time permits. We do encourage you as you're watching to send them along. We are monitoring them and you can add them into the chat. Um, you can also add any comments as we're going forward on the broadcast. And we also will be sharing links um, like the ones that we just heard from um, uh, our director of civil rights. We'll be putting links so that you can access um, some of the sites that we're talking about for your protection. Um, at this time, I'd like to introduce our employee rights panelists. And I'll start with Michelle Sakurka, Esquire. She is the president and CEO of New Jersey Business and Industry Association. Thank you. Next, we have Deborah Lancaster, who is the executive director for the Center for Women and Work School of Management and Labor Relations at Rutgers the State University. I would also like to welcome Dr. Patricia Campos Medina, the Executive Director of the Worker Institute for Labor and Unions at Cornell University. Please join me in welcoming Latanya Pouncey, President and CEO of Talent Mix Solutions. And we're so happy to have with us today, CEO Mara Guevara, the Executive Vice President, Chief Operating Officer, and Chief Legal Officer at Greater Bergen Community Action, Inc. I'd like to welcome you all. 
And let's jump into the heart of it all. Um, we'll start with you, Dr. Medina. Uh, I know in your role as Executive Director at the Worker Institute for Labor and Unions at Cornell University, you are deeply involved in many aspects of the workplace protection, including um, I know that you've been partnering with the National Conference on Worker Safety and Health, and you developed a curriculum um, on sexual violence uh, prevention, which is so incredibly needed in this space. So I also know that much of your work revolves around advancing worker rights. Um, you are a champion for that, <laughs> for sure. Um, you have also been focused on economic and racial justice for contemporary labor and issues concerning the working class. So some people may think that different types of workers deal with different types of employee violations, that some of the ones that we're talking about, you know, are, you know, just kind of hit certain areas of work. So what violations are the working class experiencing and what resources are available for our working class employees to make sure that they are protected and how can they access them? Well, thank you so very much for inviting me to be part of this discussion. Um, I think that uh, any opportunity that we have to inform our public about what's available for them to uh, protect their rights and protect their rights in the workplace, I think is a, a welcome opportunity. We have to do more. Um, um, I'm Dr. Patricia Campos Medina, Executive Director of the Worker Institute at the School of Industrial and Labor Relations at Cornell University. Uh, the School of Industrial and Labor Relations focuses on advancing research, uh, education, and training uh, that supports uh, economic justice and employ employment rights in the workplace. And we do that both for employers uh, and for uh, business. And we prepare labor attorneys. And we also prepare uh, leadership for the labor movement. So we are encompassing the entire um, uh, a scope of labor relations in the United States. We were founded in the 1940s uh, as a mandate to educate the public about the protections of the labor rights uh, law under the NLRA, the National Labor Relations Act. My institute, the Worker Institute, focuses on, on education, training, leadership development, and uh, outreach and policy development to assist workers and labor unions in advancing collective bargaining rights and collective power in the workplace. So I wanted to put it into context mm -hmm. because I do one piece Part of the work <laughs> yeah. at the School of Industrial and Labor Relations. And we focus specifically as to look at what's happening in the workplace uh, to workers and what are labor unions doing about in response uh, to what's the changes in the workplace and then how we facilitate training and opportunities and partnerships to advance the education and the knowledge of employees and unions of how to access their rights. And in that context, I think we need to start from the premise that um, we have a, 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 a set of labor rights enshrined on the National Labor Relations Act that protects the rights of workers to engage in collective bargaining rights, the, the, the right of collective action. Uh, that means that you have the right, whether in the private sector or in the public sector, to join a union, to seek uh, power and to build power to defend yourself and, and allow yourself from the laws that our government is supposed to be <laughs> enforcing uh, through our, you know, you know we, had, we heard from our representative from the Civil Rights Department, those are laws that we have been able to advance in the policy making arena to protect the rights of workers, right? But we also need organized labor and we need organizations to actually educate and enforce them. We work in coalition with um, NICOSH in the education component with NELP, National Employment Law Center, but we also have coalitions directly with labor unions and with the National AFL-CIO and the AFL-CIO, the uh, American Federation of Labor Work Employees. So, the premise, National Labor Relations Act, and that's a basic protection of the right uh, to collective bargaining. Uh, then, then we have um, the uh, the laws that protect us and this and, and the discrimination, right? Uh, and laws against anti uh, sexual harassment that, that we talked about. That is a process of education. In the United States, labor rights are individually uh, driven. A worker has to file a complaint of a labor right violation. So in order to have more power, you have to be part of a collective. And that means that you have to you have more power when you join a union. So that's what we focus on, how do we advance the right of collective action through labor organizing and through our 
training labor leaders to understand the dynamics of the rights in the workplace. And so I will start there. I don't want to take more space, but I think that the more we understand that the, the, the power of workers lies in their ability to come together and organize into a union to fight for equal pay, to fight for anti-sexual harassment laws, and to fight for anti-discrimination laws, that is the power that they hold. Ultimately, though, labor unions are also employers. So labor unions are also uh, on, have to also comply with labor law. So we also do a lot of training for labor leaders to understand what is the responsibility in their organization to also act as responsible employers. And the ultimate thing that I always tell um, allies is that not every employer is a bad employer. There's Every employer wants to do the right thing by the law. Some of them don't understand it. Some of them don't have the resources. But if we do not weed out the bad employers who make money by exploiting the law, by exploiting employees, you only make it more difficult for good employers to do the right thing. Yeah. So my job is to make sure that those bad employers on, uh, you know, are, are, brought, are brought out to do the right thing. And that's the job that we do as, uh, at, the, at the labor, at the Workers' Rights Institute. Well, and that's a very important piece that you're raising. And again, what I am very grateful for in terms of this esteemed panel that we have is that they really, between all of the perspectives up here, we really cover the entire workforce um, and every aspect of it. So thank you for sharing that. Um, so within that, let's talk about civil service employees, Dr. Medina. Um, what roles do unions play in protecting their rights? I, I continue with the premise that every worker, whether it's in the private sector or in the public sector, have the right to collective power, collective organizing, collective power through a union. So uh, um, protections of civil uh, public sector employment is protected under a civil rights, under a civil service rules. And we do have a civil service uh, commission here in New Jersey that spells out the rights of employee. And specifically, it limits the, uh, it protects, uh, you have to have due cause for to be able to, uh, to fire or discipline an employee. That's the biggest protection. However, the union uh, engages in the process of negotiating the conditions of employment. You know, in civil service, you cannot negotiate the wages. Those are set by the civil service. Law. But you can engage in negotiations about your the, the working conditions and the process of discipline and the process of uh, uh, eliminating discrimination and sexual harassment. So that's why it's important to understand the civil service rules. Mm -hmm. But it's also important to understand your collective bargaining agreement in your department, in your union. You have a right to understand what are the work the work rules that your union has agreed to in the workplace there is a there's always there's a there's a collective bargaining agreement that you can get we used to have it in a book you know you can get it now you can have it online and i would uh, in, entice and, and recommend that every civil service member in new jersey makes it a point to understand who their union representative is many of them are members of cwa uh, the as uh, or other unions, there's many unions that represent civil service in New Jersey, make a point to know who your uh, business rep is, who your union rep is, and ask for your collective bargaining agreement. And that's where it will spell out the responsibilities of the union to defend you in case there is a grievance uh, and there is a discipline disciplinary process. Or if you actually have a sexual harassment complaint or a workplace bullying, remember, sexual harassment happens when you don't address workplace bullying. And you have to proactively, as an employer, identify workplace violence in the place of bullying and address it and nip it before you actually create an environment that is hostile to women or to people who are non-gender, uh, that have a different type of gender identity. Mm -hmm. And that is, we see more and more of that in our workplaces. Sexual harassment is not just against women, it's against any individual that has a, a different gender identity. And we have to be more aware of how to deal with those issues in their employer. And so I think the theme that we will keep hearing in these conversations today, and obviously is at the core of the toolkit, is that as an employee, you will be empowered by information. And yeah. we, you know, are giving you lots of resources to know if you are a part of a union, if you are connected to civil service, you need to know and understand the, the policies and the procedures related 
to being connected to those entities to be able to support you. Um, and that, again, is the whole point of the toolkit is being able to give you access to resources and services um, to be able to empower you to protect yourself. So with that, Michelle, let's talk a little bit about workplace protection from your perspective. Um, as the president of New Jersey Business and Industry Association, you're working with all types of employers and all types of work environments. Um, tell me a little bit about how employers can create a positive workplace environment and how does workplace culture play into everything we're talking about today? So first of all, let me just say thank you for the opportunity to be with these esteemed colleagues today. Um, this conversation is significantly important for, for everybody, right? It's important for the employer, it's imp mm -hmm. important for the employee and everybody who's affected by that relationship. Um, so let me give you a little context. Okay. New Jersey Business and Industry Association, uh, we represent about 6,000 businesses across the state. And as you said, everyone from the corner pizzeria uh, to the 1,000 employee call center to the biggest utilities and hospitals you know, across the state of New Jersey, uh, very diverse. And that is New Jersey's business community. We are very diverse. Uh, so we like to represent the footprint of that. So when we put our boots on the ground each and every day, we're out there to advocate on behalf of those job creators for an affordable and regionally competitive business climate so that they can sustain and grow new jobs in the state of New Jersey. I want to emphasize that word job creator and jobs because that's where the worker comes in. And that's why the symbiotic relationship between the employer and the employee is so important because our companies can't be successful if their employees aren't successful. And we know from all the statistics we look at, employee satisfaction means productivity and good return on investment for any company. So we're very proud at NJBIA, the word education was significantly important, right? So we take a significant role in educating those that we represent on what their obligations and requirements to run a business in the state of New Jersey are. Everything from incorporating your business, but most importantly to the HR practices that are important because they're very complex. You know, the Department of Labor obligations and mandates on employers are significant and for a reason they're very important. And we believe that the work environment has to be a place where everyone can be happy and sustained to bring that productivity that we talk about, right? So our resources are a very robust um, HR platform where our members can have 24 seven access online to information and resources to help guide them on challenges they have in the workplace, as well as the opportunity to call up and talk to someone in real time. Because think about a small business, they don't have the lawyer in the back room. They don't even have the HR expert. So we try to be there to help them. Um, on compliance, we have policy committees that work every day with our employers in order to discuss with them new mandates or obligations that they have and to educate them on how to execute those obligations in the workforce for their own protection and for the good of their workforce, right? Uh, we talked today about the importance of women and particularly women of color. Um, and it is so important in the workplace that we recognize that we still have a lot of disparity and we do, right, in terms of wage. And in terms of especially coming back post COVID, we talked about childcare earlier today. So it is important that um, we pay attention to areas where we need extra protection as well. And we try and educate on DEI and the importance of diversity in the workplace as well. So some context to all of that. So now let me bring it back to culture in the work environment. Um, culture is everything. I, we know that a positive and trusting work environment is one that breeds not just success, but employee satisfaction. And what is at the heart of that? Good corporate values. And that means that you have tone at the top coming down, mm -hmm. leadership by example. It also means that you have empowered and enabled your workforce to have power to push up. And the idea that everyone can sit around a table and have an equal voice and bring the diversity that they brought into the workplace to the discussions on how the workplace and the environment should be each and every day so that everyone can be happy in that workplace. You know, that's, that's the kumbaya that we need for businesses to be successful and for workers to be satisfied to deliver that productivity that they need. This doesn't come easy, right? You don't just walk in and demand trust and respect. It has to be earned. And so it's important that um, as leaders, we model the types of environment that we want and that we hold ourselves accountable and that we hold our managers and our supervisors accountable. And I wanna echo something that was very perfectly stated. When someone starts a company or someone becomes a manager, they have the best intention to be the best that they can to do that, right? They do it for a reason. They do it for passion, whether it be mm -hmm. the product or service that they're delivering or that they're making, or because they want to enable and empower a workforce to be good, right? Great companies make great communities. And I truly believe that each and every day. 
there are bad actors out there. Yeah. When I stand up every day and advocate tirelessly on behalf of the business community, I stand up for the good actors. We call out the bad actors. What's very challenging in the state of New Jersey is when we make policy, ordinarily, we make policy to address the bad actor. Mm -hmm. And many times we bring all those good actors along. And so we have a pendulum swing that happens, right? We start with a policy that could be very overburdensome on an employer that we have to help to educate what it means for you to meet that compliance standard. But we realize where sometimes it might be so difficult that we then have to work to level set that policy to be a little more balanced. And the whole idea of everyone's voice around the table and collective bargaining, it's so important in that part too, to acknowledge and represent that the employer needs a seat at that table as much, right? So bringing the two together is significantly important. That workplace culture is significantly important. And I believe if you take your time, you know, slow and steady, enable and empower from the bottom up, be a good role model, be a good leader, take care of your community because that's where your workforce works, right? Mm -hmm. That I think together that symbiotic relationship will work well for everybody. So, you know, I know, you know, we talked a lot just now about the employer and, you know, setting the stage for creating a culture, you know, within their company. So let's talk a little bit about the employee um, when they're joining a company yes. um, or when they're considering joining a company. Um, you know, what should, what are some of the things they should be kind of having a checklist mm -hmm. in their head about mm -hmm. um, to determine if this is a place that they could thrive? Yeah, a hundred percent. Everybody has an obligation in this relationship. Uh, and it does start at the interview. An interview is a two-way street, mm -hmm. right? Um, the employer is checking you out, but you should be checking the employer out. And you should be feeling about what type of environment you may be putting yourself into uh, when you when you accept a job. So the employee should be doing as much due diligence on the, on the workplace and the employer uh, as the employer is doing on that employee. Mm -hmm. um, and sometimes you may find that for any reason, there might not be good synergy between the two. It could just be that, you know, you disagree with how they run the business all the way to you disagree with um, how they execute on a strategy. You don't like where they are. You don't like that they don't have a hybrid work environment, right? It's all these things. You know, a really easy example in a, in a post-COVID world, and I always say the employee has to lean in and meet the employer halfway, right? The employer's got to be at that table but they need the employee to lean in in this, you know, post COVID world with a hybrid remote workplace, whatever you want to call that um, worker employers are trying as best as they can to bring the flexibility that frankly we've needed and have demanded for a long time, but it just wasn't recognized. So COVID came at a very opportune time that we had a next generation coming in that was going to require a different way of doing business. And we said to all our employers at that time, you got to be leaning in here. You got to provide this flexibility or else, and first and foremost, you're going to lose the women out of the workforce, mm -hmm. right? Um, I'm a different generation, right? I'm right on that cusp of, of uh, the, the, the greatest generation to the X. I'm, I'm right that beautiful birth year in between, right? <laughs> and I think about the fact that I, I lived to work, mm. right? And the next generation works to live. And if employers don't recognize the difference in the generation and what it takes to have a successful work environment, they're going to fail. Uh, so we're there to enable and empower that, right? But it is incumbent that the employee exercise their responsibility. And I want to take this one more step. You mentioned the bad apple within the workplace, right? So it's not just the bad apple of a company who might be out there who's a bad actor, um, but we as managers and supervisors in our workplace have to make sure that when we hold people accountable, we call out the bad apples. I can't tell you how many times as an employment lawyer, which is what I did before coming to, to BIA, I am an employment lawyer. Um, how many times I would struggle with a manager who has a bad apple and they're like, I'm so afraid to get rid of them. Mm -hmm. I'm afraid they're going to sue me. Mm -hmm. Right. And we step back and say, time out. You got one bad apple and you are rotting the whole rest of your basket. And if you don't hold that person accountable and get rid of them, you're killing your culture. People need to trust that when someone breaks the rules, you're going to have zero tolerance. You're going to move them out appropriately and respectfully. And you're going to send a message of what we tolerate and don't tolerate. That goes back to that good, that good climate. And the employee has a role in that as well. And if you have that trust relationship with open door, you should be able to have those communications and hopefully avoid some of the things that we're talking about. Thank you, Michelle. So this just naturally brings us to thinking about HR. <laughs> um, you know, and we're so grateful that we have Latanya here to talk through this piece with us. So as an HR professional, you help companies guide their strategic direction their vision, their operations for their business, 
you know, all of these key and important pieces. Um, when you're working with these businesses, how is it that you see uh, retaliation manifest? Um, because I know that that's the biggest fear very often of employees in saying anything. You know, there's kind of two pieces, right? One, sometimes they're not sure what's going on. They don't have a name for it. They're trying to figure it out. But once they figured it out, they don't Oh, it. They're scared to say something about it. And they're also very scared of HR sometimes, which, you know, because mm -hmm. they feel like HR is not there to support them. They're there to support the company. So how do we help, you know, can you shed a little perspective on, on that piece of it and that fear of retaliation and how uh, we can, how HR professionals, how companies um, can navigate that fear and help employees, you know, bring them in to, to talk with you all? Sure, absolutely. Well, thank you. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, I think that this work is very important. I've been in human resources for 24 years. Um, so I take it very seriously. Um, I absolutely love what I do. Um, I love the opportunities to get to work with different industries, um, different cultures, different personalities, different leadership styles. And what you just said and what Michelle just said and what everyone has who has spoken so far has mentioned is HR has an obligation. And I always say this, HR has an obligation. We have a tough role, a very important role, but it's very critical at the same time. We have to manage the organization's expectations um, requirements, as well as the employee's expectation and their requirements. And when we, you know, at the, how I look at this is at the foundation of everything is diversity, equity, inclusion, mm -hmm. particularly in what we're talking about here today. And at the foundation of that is respect. And when you lose that, that's when things really start to fall apart. People, um, they don't think clearly, they don't, they lack emotional intelligence and they start to really do things that number one simply just don't make sense um and um and they just don't have respect for their policies and procedures um even if they are good policies and procedures in place um and and they just start to be careless and one of the things that hr really has an obligation to do should be doing and can do is really work with leaders and their ceos to really be transparent about the policies and procedures, um, the expectations of the organization, what's required of leaders and all employees. And it's important that um, leaders know, and as well as HR leaders know that um, you don't have to do this work alone. You know, people make up an organization and the culture of it. So it's everyone's responsibility. But as we all know, everyone has their own roles and responsibilities and parts to play in an organization. And as an HR leader, there should be policies and procedures in place that prevent retaliation. And when it rears its ugly head, we have to call it out. It's important to call it out because employees deserve to come to a place that is safe, where they feel that they can speak up and um, that there are methods in place that they can call out retaliation. And, um, as it was said already, we have an obligation to model that behavior, both HR as well as leaders across the organization. We need to model that behavior. We need to communicate um, ways that employees can speak up about retaliation, discrimination, um, you know, pay inequity, um, anything that is not pleasing and is, and is anything that is certainly illegal and that is happening in the organization. We need to be communicating uh, frequently because mm -hmm. oftentimes what happens is policies and procedures get put in place, but then they're on the shelf. And then you're not constantly being um, you know, proactive to communicate upfront you know, um, things that should be going on, things, how to identify um, retaliation, which you know, can, can manifest in a lot of different ways. And one of the most, um, you know, you know, one of the most frequent ways that retaliation often happens is, is harassment, mm -hmm. um, is discrimination. Um, you know, some of the other subtle and microaggressions that happen is you're leaving employees out of important meetings, um, out of social events. That often happens a lot. Um, you'll start to have um, employees or leaders start to use profanity at employees. Uh, which is certainly inappropriate, um, belittling employees in front of others, 
um, again, the lack of respect uh, that you have in organizations or, or in, and it really starts with the individual, right? But when HR sees these things and you have to understand that you're always being watched from the CEO on down you and up in the C-suite and HR, you're always being watched. And so when retaliation comes about, and if you don't immediately address it, people are going to say, wow, we can't trust HR. We can't go to them because here it is. I came to you, or I clearly see that you're seeing this and you're allowing the behavior to go on. And so what happens is now people take this outside of the organization and they start talking about it. We have social media now, mm -hmm. online platforms, and people start saying things that are happening. And now it starts to take a hit against your brand, your reputation, um, your attention, um, attraction and retention of employees. If if my organization starts to get a bad reputation um, that, you know, different and inappropriate discrimination, retaliation, and harassment um, claims are, are happening, and I'm not doing anything about it, no one is going to want to come work for me. And then those who are working are going to want to leave. And, and so, you know, that's definitely going to happen. Um, so there's a lot of different ways that retaliation happens. Um, some of those are very subtle. And you have, and as HR leaders, we have to be able to recognize them. And again, we have to be able to address them. Um, train leaders, we should be training leaders on um, appropriate behavior in the workplace, um, harassment, the legalities around that. As HR leaders, I tell um, other HR colleagues, and particularly those who are coming up in the field, employment attorneys are your best friend. <laughs> It's uh, employment attorneys are your best friends because HR can't cannot resolve everything on its own, and it's not just you know dissolved, um, designed to do so. That's why we partner with attorneys, you know, because they have that experience, and we don't give legal advice. Um, but we definitely need to be able to pull attorneys in um, where appropriate, have the prop, um, proper discussions, and then determine next steps. And a lot of time, when you're committing illegal activities protected activities um, within the state of New Jersey, um, ultimately it can cost you your job. So, you know, it's important that HR also has an understanding of the employment laws mm -hmm. in the state that they're mm -hmm. operating, right? Because if you don't even have an understanding of it, how can you identify it and protect your employees, protect your leaders and be able to balance it and be able to coach other leaders and say, hey, um, you need to stop. We need to, you need to step back. You need to think about this. Um, this is in violation of our policy. And if you don't feel like you can do that, then honestly, you need to rethink if HR is the right career for you. So, Latana, you mentioned equal pay. And, you know, obviously for women and for women of color, this is a huge issue. Mm -hmm. Um, that we are constantly navigating. Can you talk to us a little bit about how HR departments and um, how organizations comply with equal pay laws and practices and how we can ensure that they comply with them, I should say, and also how employees can navigate understanding where their pay is in relation to where it should be and how they can advocate for that for themselves? Sure, absolutely. Um... There are a lot of organizations that participate in compensation surveys. I did it for a number of years mm -hmm. when I worked in corporate. And, you know, what this does is um, you have organizations will work with compensation vendors um, who will go out, have organizations from a variety of industries of all sizes um, based on revenue, um, industry, um, employee size, will participate in surveys. And then what they would do is they would compile and do an analysis. And then they would, um, each company would have that analysis. So when they're doing their annual compensation, um, they could look at, you know, based on number one, how well the, the um, company is performing, um, you know, to determine pay increases. But before you can do all of that, it's really important that organizations really have compensation policies in place to determine um, how pay is, is structured 
and, and who makes the decisions around pay, how do, um, job descriptions are developed, how they're defined, um, performance metrics, what performance metrics are in place, um, what levels um, throughout the organization um, will be, will be um, defined by these pay metrics and particularly, particularly leaders in the organization. And um, so you really have to have your policies and procedures, and particularly also if you have commission structures in place, you really need to have a policy around that because when you have salespeople, business development professionals um, in your organizations, oftentimes they're going to want to see the, your policy around commission, right? So they can compare it to what they currently have or what they've had in, a play, in, in the past. Mm -hmm. So when they're coming on board, um, also, um, if you have, if you offer long-term incentives around stock options, um, restricted stock units, uh, deferred compensation, you know, those sorts of plans, a lot of leaders will want to understand, um, you know, how your particular um, benefit offering, you know, stacks up to something that they are currently receiving or something that they have received in the past. So it's really important to have policies and procedures around those pay practices. Um, so when questions do come up, you can refer to those guidelines, but also to make sure that the company is adhering to those guidelines. So it really helps, you know, to keep the company um, on track as well. And they can certainly change over time. And but you need to be making sure that you're updating those those guidelines. Um, another thing um, organizations can do, and some organizations have done, is um, conduct pay pay analysis and pay audits. Right. Um, oftentimes there may be um, you know, rumblings coming through where you have a number and oftentimes it's women and either um, Black, Latina, Asian Americans or Pan-Asian American professionals who, um, you know, are, are complaining that their pay is not on par compared to their colleagues and they have the same years of experiences, the same types of credentials. Um, and so you now may need to look at and do a pay analysis where you're looking at your pay rates by job categories, um, by gender, and, um, and and really seeing if there's any pay um, discrepancies and disparities um, in your pay rate. And if there are, oftentimes what companies have to do is decide if they can, how they can bring the organization um, and those individuals, excuse me, up to par. And when you're doing that, it's really important that you look at the full um, spectrum. So oftentimes what happens is when people are doing an audit um, on pay, they're they're looking at they will just look at those underserved professionals primarily. But what's really important that you look at it by full ethnicity. So you're looking at white males, white women, black men, black women, um, Latino women and men, um, Asian American women and men. So you can really get the full perspectives because when you really look at it that way, it really is an eye opener. Mm -hmm. It really is an eye opener for you to, to really see the percentage of how low one group is or one gender is compared to another. Um, so doing pay um, at audits and analysis um, is really good. Uh, promoting paid transparency. Mm -hmm. um, and it's, in the state of New Jersey, it's not required to have um, uh, your actual pay rates or um, your salaries on job descriptions, mm -hmm. but it is a good practice. Mm -hmm. It is a good practice. Our, our next door neighbor does it, yeah. New York City. Yeah. Um, so it is a good practice. Does it come with, you know, some hiccups sometimes? It can but you can avoid that if you really do your due diligence as an organization to really understand um, what those hiccups could potentially be and to get around them. Um, you can also um, get over that challenge if you have already identified that your organization is, you know, is pretty equal across the board. Um, and yes, we understand that some salaries may be a little different because, um, you know, some professionals may have a certain license or credential that's hard to find or hard to fill um, compared to some someone else. So, of course, that requires a more compensation. Um, also, years of experience, a certain industry. There could be a lot of variables that go into different um, pay, right? But when it comes to also employees, it's also important that they do their due diligence, right? So um, speak to other um, colleagues who are similar 
and doing the same type of work that you're doing in the same industry, same type of um, organization, um, the, the same size. Um, refer to your professional organizations. Many times those organizations will have um, uh, salary data that they can that they are happy to provide back to um, you know to their to their members. Also, you know, reach out to a couple of colleagues and just say, "Hey, would you would you mind, um, you know, sh you know, sharing what your salary, um, um, you know, salary range is for a particular field, or you know, even if you're looking, you know, to go into a different industry, you know, ask the questions." But it's important that organizations also know that when employees are asking those questions, it is an illegal practice for you to retaliate against them for asking the question. It is illegal and HR needs to be mindful of that. So if they hear it, when a leader comes back to them, they should be able to coach them and say, it's nothing wrong with them asking the question. They're not doing anything illegal. Um, we should be able to support them and, um, and making sure that they understand how pay is determined and making sure that they feel comfortable um, that they're being paid fairly, especially if they are a good employee. What, why wouldn't we want to talk to the employee and share how we determine pay um, and, and also to communicate that we want to ensure that they, they're being paid fairly because we value the contributions and the work that they bring to our organization and we wanna make sure that they stay with us, mm -hmm. right? Why wouldn't anyone wanna do that? And that's how we should definitely um, want to move as an organization and that's what HR should be encouraging. Mm -hmm. And we wanna encourage employees um, to do that when they feel that it is necessary to have the conversation around um, compensation, but it's important that organizations set it up that the environment is safe for them to do so. Can I just, if I could throw out a strategy, because we talked about, you know, women in this, in this process, obviously, and go back to the hiring process and something that mm -hmm. bums me out as a woman um, is uh, we're not really good at negotiating for ourselves. Mm -hmm. So I want to go back to the hiring process because there's an example that I heard that makes me absolutely crazy and why equity starts at day one when you walk in the door, right? Men are really good at, at negotiating and women, we have to have more confidence when we walk in the door on day one. Uh, and you talked about those, those ranges of salary, right? So we have two recruiters behind door A and door B, right? And behind and, and the, the, the position that they are hiring for has a range of 80 to 120, $100,000, right? So woman goes is recruiting behind door one, man's recruiting behind door two. Recruiters have the exact same um, ability to offer packages here. And it happens that they both get offered $100,000 based upon their existing current credentials that they're bringing in. The woman leans across the table and says, when do I start? Thank you very much. The man says, that's great. I need 110. The recruiter has the authority to go to 110. He says, great, you got a deal. You, you have pay equity on day one. That is off. So if we can encourage our women to get their negotiation skills on day one when they go to recruit for the job, I think that some of this can be headed off at the very beginning. And this is a conversation that we host at the YWCA regularly in terms of, um, and you know, there's a lot of other great resources for this too, but, and it's a very important piece and definitely something that probably deserves its own town hall discussion <laughs> unto its own because that is so key in the empowerment of the mm -hmm. issue. So, you know, Latanya, all you talked about, about equal pay there just made me think about the equal pay legislation we have in New Jersey, which leads mm -hmm. me to Deborah. Um, Deborah, as the executive director of the Center for Women and Work, um, and, you know, you're centered around advocating for women's rights and supporting their well-being, you know, mm -hmm. in the work that you do there. But, you know, we know here in New Jersey, despite having, I mean, we just heard about it, despite having... Um, one of the strongest equal pay laws in the country. The gender wage gap still continues to be a pervasive issue. We yeah. we don't seem to be able to, despite having the law, to say check, you know, on that one. Yeah. So why is that? Why is that? So the gender wage gap is just like a really complicated issue. Yeah. And I think that, um, and and we. Uh, so, so, and I just want to say that the Center for Women and Work is embedded uh, in the School of Management and Labor Relations at, at Rutgers University, and uh, we've been around for 30 years, um, advancing women's equity in um, communities and in the workplace. And I think that New Jersey, as we've heard uh, earlier, you know, we have a lot to be proud of mm -hmm. um, in terms of, you know, our legislative advances to protect workers that help advance equity. 
in the workplace. We also know there's a lot of room in the private sector to lead here. And there's, you know, we have leadership in that arena and we see companies adopting practices that go further than what the law requires. But that said, you know, New Jersey women, like the rest of the country, quite frankly, um, continue to experience this gender wage gap. And it was for too earlier. It's, you know, hovers around 80 cents, 83 cents for all women compared to white men. For Latinas, that gap is much larger. New Jersey kind of ranks near the bottom yeah. um, for our gender wage gap. Um, and for Black women, it's about uh, 52 cents Latinas for anyway. So it's all... Mm all over the place. Um, and a new report that we issued uh, this spring um, also talks about the uh, uh, pay equity gap for working mothers, where we're also ranked near the bottom. The reason isn't straight up discrimination explains some of the gender wage gap. You know, like you said, from day one, pay equity could be off because someone's starting at 100 and someone's starting at 110, right? Um, but there's a larger part of the um, gender wage gap that can be explained by occupational segregation. So women being tracked into yeah. lower wage jobs. Mm -hmm. um, I would argue the undervaluation of care work. So if we think about where are where where do women work and, and often thrive, quite frankly, and kind of keep our society yeah. together, it's in the schools, it's in childcare, it's hospital. in social work, it's in human services, it's, it's in health care, it's yeah. taking care of the old and the young, which is incredibly valuable work. I think we all mm -hmm. agree, but the value and the culture that we're in like doesn't assign value to that work. And so that explains a decent part of the gender wage gap. And then on top of that, women um, bear children, right? Like so far we're the, you know, um, and uh, we um, take time off from work um, to care for the old and our old, our, our, our old, old, what am I saying? Our parents, mm -hmm. our children, et cetera, you know, sick children, sick spouses. Um, so we step away from the paid workforce and that also exacerbates the gender wage gap. Um, and those um, burdens or opportunities because care work could be wonderful. It also can be a burden depending on what's going on in your life um, are not shared equally. And again, for all kinds of reasons, sometimes it's a practical matter. Your your spouse or partner makes more, they're, they're male. And so, okay, let's be practical. I'm gonna stay home then, right? And childcare we know is incredibly expensive um, and we don't have, and it's not just New Jersey. I mean, our country in general does not have kind of a, a universal approach to, you know, um, uh, uh, of working families being able to access affordable quality child care, you know, so we have kind of a fragmented system there. So um, that's kind of, and, and that's why I think like policies like paid family leave, like we have in New Jersey um, and access to affordable quality child care or our policies that won't solve the gender wage gap, but they can help work toward closing that gap. And there's plenty of other strategies as well, as well including that negotiation when you, when you get, uh, um, including individual negotiation, but there's also some structural reasons that we have that persistence of the gap. Thank you. So you started to mention at the end there a few other um, policies yeah. and processes that you know are important for workers to know about. You know, we've touched on a lot of areas. Is there anything we haven't touched on here that you yeah. want to make sure that we lift up that our employees should be aware of in terms of a law or a yeah. right here in New Jersey? Well, first of all, I just want to say the suite of videos that you've come out with is mm -hmm. like an incredible tool yeah. because I think what we know is, you know, unions are fabulous at helping, you know, they can be fabulous at helping people know their rights. There's collective bargaining agreements and HR departments are also fabulous resource. But I would, I mean, I don't have the data in front of me, but I think probably the majority, I mean, for sure, the majority of our workers are not in unions and probably a growing yes. number do not have access to HR departments, mm -hmm. right? Like, and, you know, we have a lot of mid-size and small businesses and those managers and owners are kind of doing everything. Um, and so the resource that this provides, I think is super helpful, whether you're a young worker or a worker who's been around a long time, um, there's a lot uh, in those videos and in that kind of training and education. Um, so, I think um, so. And these forums are great for being able to disseminate, you know, and remind New, Jer New Jersey residents that there is this paid family leave um, law that uh, provides most employees to access to paid family leave to take care of themselves or a loved one. 
Um, and there's a lot of resources on the internet, which I'll share with you later mm -hmm. that yes. um, can help walk you through that. Some of that's just right on the Department of Labor website. Um, there's also some newer legislation that New Jersey um, has passed. There's a Domestic Worker Bill of Rights. Um, a number of years ago, before the pandemic, we worked with um, some domestic or the National Domestic Workers Alliance and their affiliates in New Jersey to collect some data on the experiences that domestic workers um, were having. And um, like a little, um, it's not a fun fact, actually, but uh, a um, one of the findings of the survey that uh, we partnered with the domestic workers on was that 50% of domestic workers, these are workers who work in homes like cleaning um, and uh, healthcare and um, uh, taking care of children, 57% um, of them experienced wage theft. Mm -hmm. um, and so in domestic workers have historically been left out of labor protections and labor laws for a whole, that's also a whole other thing we could have a town hall mm -hmm. on. But so there is this um, legislation that just went into effect July 1. And I think it's important as those regulations are developed that both employers, so many people have uh, cleaning help um, and other kinds of domestic help um, in their households. And just to be aware of this legislation and um, thinking of themselves as you know, what they can do to be a good employer. Um, and also domestic workers, um, there's a lot of education and outreach that organizations are doing to educate domestic workers about, about that law. So that's one example. Um, and you know, we also have earned sick leave in New Jersey. Um, and again, I think that's a good example of legislation that was addressing employers that don't already offer that. Um, which was in, and I could go on, but I know that we have other speakers. Yes. Um, <laughs> well, so, we'll, we'll, but so, I, yeah. what I can do is share some of those resources with you. But I think that, you know, there's, I, I think that um, it's yeah. an ongoing process to educate ourselves, our employees, our youth yeah. about what their rights are and what employer obligations are and kind of expectations and also um and just and to totally add, yeah. and just to yeah. add a plug in mm -hmm. because um uh domestic work uh, mm -hmm. there's a whole has been a whole movement to improve uh the uh, working conditions of domestic workers in the home so we at the worker institute have mm -hmm. a whole training program called nanny we rise mm -hmm. uh and it's in partnership with employers a uh, hand in hand to actually yeah. uh uh not uh, provide educational opportunities for the employer to understand their, their, um, their obligations once you hire help that works in your house. And remember this is different because uh, when you hire somebody to take care of your loved one at home, you're the employer, you don't have an HR department, mm -hmm. but you still have obligations as, a, as an employer to live up to. So um, I'll provide that information too. It's called the Nanny We Rise program. And we, uh, we provide it uh, in, in partnership with employers who want to um, uh, uh, train their people who are hiring home care workers, nannies, to understand uh, the, um, the demands and the responsibilities. And just for everyone um, to be aware, a lot of the resources that are being mentioned here are all part of the toolkit, which we'll talk about at the end. Um, there'll be links there so that you can connect to them. And I'm so grateful that we have the expertise here on this panel to be able to uh, put together um, that strong resource for all of you. Um, so, you know, we've talked about a lot of different workplaces. I'm so grateful that we have Siomata here because she's talking about a workplace where I've made my entire career. No and it's one that people don't always think of as a um, business sector. Um, Linda Sisko from the Center for Nonprofits would tell you that, you know, the nonprofit sector here in the state of New Jersey is uh, employing a very significant amount of the workforce. Mm -hmm. um, and so with that, you bring that perspective, an employer perspective um, from a nonprofit business. So from that perspective, how does all of this look? Does it look any different? Does it look the same? Um, you know, what are some examples of that? Because, you know, I'm sure we have people that will, um, you know, grab the toolkit, you know, to look for resources that work in the nonprofit sector. Right. Thank you. So thank you for inviting me. Um, I'm happy to share some of our, the perspective of an employer, but I think the uniqueness is of a nonprofit employer. Correct. Right. So I guess our biggest difference is that our mission, we're always struggling and trying to balance the mission of our organization, which is to our mm -hmm. community, but also to what it looks like in, in, you know, as you're an operation, 
operation, um, the internal operations of a nonprofit, right? Um, and so that struggle and that balance, knowing that we're always looking for social justice, one of our causes, right, mm -hmm. in our nonprofits, but then also thinking of what that looks like for our employees mm -hmm. becomes a challenge. Mm -hmm. um, just as a perspective, Greater Bergen has over 500 employees. We provide over 60 different programs. Our biggest program is Head Start program. Um, we provide Head Start to all of Bergen County, the city of Patterson, and the city of Jersey City. We provide anything from having a low-income designated credit union to weatherization, home energy, social service, an immigrant resource center, educate adult education programs. So the perspective I want you to see is that we're seeing a lot of our workers are teachers mm -hmm. with all of the different certifications that any teacher needs to have, maybe attorneys, maybe financial advisors, masters in social workers for our case match. So we have a, a variety of different employees, those who are cleaning the facilities that we own, mm -hmm. right? Those who go and do tech work, um, you know, IT workers, just a variety. Um, and I think that as an employer, because we have these demands of a social mission, plus that we do have a lot of different challenges and some may look the same, some are very unique. One of them being our financial constraints. Mm -hmm. um, we, our budgets look like come from grants from donors mm -hmm. who tell us what to do, how to spend our money. Um, and some of some of them um, have a perspective to know how, what it takes to run a program and others don't. They give us very limited amounts of, of funding mm -hmm. to to do the work that we do. Him. So that financial well, constraint lights. <laughs> um, impacts salaries and salary scales and ranges, but also impacts where we can actually invest money. Right. So in doing training or, or having. I would love to have you full time in my <laughs> offices, but can I afford to have a consultant to really do all that information? That's always difficult. And it's that balance of looking at that. The staffing limitations, everyone is having staffing issues. Mm -hmm. We're looking at the same issues. Mm -hmm. we're, we're having a hard time finding staff um, because we have to work within a range of what our budget looks like and also what the compliance for the programs look like. Because mm -hmm. we live in a compliance world just as any other mm -hmm. business. And to us, a nonprofit compliance, if we don't follow it, can mean um, losing our reputation in a community, which is so important to us, having um, financial penalties, and even losing our tax exempt status if we're not being compliant. So all of this is also something that we we struggle with on a daily basis. And, and finally, the turnover, right? Um, at this point, because of the way that nonprofits look, um, we've become a training ground where we get a lot of the professionals when they're starting out in their careers, but maybe this isn't where they stay the whole time. And, and you know, I get it. You find a different opportunity. You, you get paid some better somewhere else, you're going to leave. But that's becoming an issue that is affecting us in the nonprofit sector mm -hmm. because, you know, maybe in the beginning of your career, you want to do it because you believe in the cause. But then as time goes by and you have other responsibilities, we're not always the best employer, the best option. And so I think, you know, those are some of the similar yet not similar <laughs> um, burdens that we, we're we looking at today. Yes. And as a fellow nonprofit uh, CEO, <laughs> CEO, I can um, uh, fully empathize with all, you know, that you're sharing and, um, you know, the, you know, what we as an organization have. Um, done to try to promote workplace protection and address some of these issues. Um, but we're not here to hear about me. We're here to hear about you. So tell us some of the things that Greater Bergen has done to promote workplace protection within your nonprofit environment. Because as you said, you know, there are some inherent challenges in the structure um, of a nonprofit that's a little bit different than a for-profit entity. Um, but at the same time, we should be held and we, these practices should be, you know, high on our list in terms of how we proceed. Well, I'm glad to say that many of the things you have all talked about are thankfully things that we practice. Um, but I think that the first thing um, in addressing this question is the change in culture. Um, we have done a lot of work and I've only been in this organization and in this position in the past three years. So we've done a lot of work mm -hmm. to change the culture, to 
you know, what's important to us. And so the first thing we did was change our, you know, the title of our Department of Human Resources to Human Capital and Culture, so that that is the focus of who we are. And we understand that our our human capital is the most important thing that we have at the organization. And that culture was going to be really important to us moving forward. Part of that culture has been education. And we have focused not only on leadership, but middle management, because we thought those are the people who are looking and supervising and working with employees on a daily basis. So educating them on what leaves are, what retaliation, all of the different things that you're addressing today is things that we've been addressing. Um, and constantly, because we have such turnovers, we can't expect for once a year mm -hmm. to be enough. So that's a constant um, education. And the other thing that we have taken very seriously is to talk about what termination can look like for employees, um, the whys, the hows, the what happens. And so we take, we've done a lot of work around that um, because it's been important to us. Um, we've also changed and made sure that our policies are clear. Mm -hmm. easy to understand mm -hmm. not to me who's an attorney but to anybody who's reading this policy manual so it's more i believe user friendly today than it was maybe a few years ago the other thing that we do is that we try to make sure that we can translate it in different languages mm -hmm. our um we probably have over 20 languages that are represented to um across our different um employees and so we try to make sure that things are and that the people that speak to our HR department is can be bilingual. And if not, we have translation services that are just a phone call away so that anybody can have that conversation and, and talk. And that's been very important, at least to me, who grew up in an immigrant household where my parents just could never have advocated for themselves. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's been important to make those changes. And I think people feel a lot more comfortable coming into the office knowing that they can speak. Everybody knows. English, but some people just feel more comfortable speaking some things in their own native language, right? Um, legal counsel, I'm an attorney, so I believe in legal counsel, but not all nonprofits can afford it. It is not affordable. Um, so looking to our insurances, which we have to pay anyway, to mm -hmm. what can they provide and what information they could provide has been helpful as a nonprofit. Um, the pro bono partnership here in yeah. New Jersey is excellent. Um, you know, uh, our organization, because of its size, can no longer participate. But there's other nonprofits that are still, you know, are eligible. So I think they're they do amazing work and they help. Um, but in you know working with other just private attorneys who may want to do some pro bono work, who may want to just review your, you know, I've I've worked in nonprofits for way too many years, but in the past, I've had attorneys just give me their time to just review your, you know, your uh, manual, if you can't afford to have it just overhauled. So I think there's different ways. Um, not having the money can should not be the reason not to have to mm -hmm. seek the legal counsel, because it's really important. Um, making sure that all the records that we have are detailed, accurate, um, has been important to us for both sides. You know, we have employees who have, who have asked us uh, to sign off on mortgage applications, on, uh, you know, the um, public service loan, uh, and so those type of things. We have to make sure that we have the right information, accurate information. So that's really important. Um, making sure that um, we're updating our policies regularly. So we don't wait till like five years or we're doing it on a yearly basis. Um, and sometimes some of those have to be done out on a by um, yearly basis. So, I mean, in the middle of the year. Um, but those are some of the things that we've mm -hmm. been doing to change, make sure that it's out there. The other thing I would say is that, you know, New Jersey a year ago had a grant to do some outreach in the communities for disability, you know, so that people understand the different disabilities. We were one of the grantees and it was, um, it was great for the staff to know that that was the type of programs that were important for us to also be in outreach and do. And I think that as nonprofits, we have to make sure that the programs that we're, we're actually doing work with reflect also what our employees want to see in our community. Mm -hmm. So, you know, as you were talking, our businesses are the communities we are. And, yeah. and as a nonprofit, we even have a bigger accountability mm -hmm. of that. So, so yeah. that was really important for yeah. us. I could not agree more. Um, mm -hmm. That's 
platform I take on regularly for yeah. us as a <laughs> business um, line. Um, and I also do want to shout out Pro Bono Partnership because they really are a significant resource for nonprofit organizations. Yeah. I know we've been the benefit of their tremendous services for the 14 years that I've been at the YWCA of Northern New Jersey. And, um, you know, it, it is a link we can include also in the um, uh, resource so that, you know, you can know how to, uh, if you're coming from the nonprofit sector and a nonprofit employer, that you know how to access them. So that was such an important download um, <laughs> that we just did. There was yeah. so much information in there. And that's the good thing about this is that um, if you were watching this and think, oh, I wish so-and-so was watching, they can watch. This is going to be memorialized. It will be part of the toolkit. It will remain on our Facebook page. It'll remain on our YouTube channel. Um, so you will be able to access this at any point and continue to um, go back and take notes from all that you've heard. Um, we did have one question come in, which I'd like to share, and it, it kind of touches on something that you started with, Michelle. Um, you know, in this environment that the world has changed with technology and there is so much remote, you know, there's so much of a remote workforce happening, whether it's fully remote or hybrid, um, how does that impact um, workplace rights and more specifically women's workplace rights? How is the, how is the interplay of the hybrid um, and the remote environment um, impacting our employees and their protections and their rights or, you know, or does it? And please feel free to individually jump in. I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll start. Um, so the whole hybrid environment is something we're all still working through four years later. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, just no doubt about it. Um, I'm a walk the building person. So when I had everybody in my office in Trenton, I literally could go walk and stop by someone's office. I could see, how are you doing? I could ask them. I loved going to, you know, get a cup of coffee and talk to somebody, you know, on the floor who was also doing that. It's talking to somebody in the ladies room, right? I mean, when you're, when you're physically connected, it's a totally different dynamic. Uh, I do think remote um, takes a hit to culture. And I think you have to lean into it and say, so what do I make up for, for the lack of physicality? Mm -hmm. uh, and that means bringing people together as you can physically at certain points in time. I just use us as an example, right? We, every month we have an all staff meeting physically in the office. I took away the hybrid for that. I said, if I'm asking you once a month to show up in the office, you're showing up because it's so important, but we make it worthwhile. You're not just showing up to, for us to be a talking head about something. We engage, we have an activity, we do strategy, whatever it may be. Um, I try as a leader, I tried this quarterly, I couldn't do it at least twice a year to have a one-on-one -on -one Teams meeting with every one of my staff. My staff's about 32. That's why I can't do it four times a year. But if I can't look you in the eye, right? The other part of this is when we have meetings, I encourage everyone to have their cameras on. Mm -hmm. Now I realize I've come into your home. I may have enabled you to work from home, but I still brought the workplace into your home. So I've created, I hope, a safe space that I don't care if the dog goes by. I don't care if he jumps on your lap. I don't care if the cat's sitting on your desk. And if your child comes by because now it's four o'clock in the afternoon and they're home from school and you're still on the clock, good for me, you're still on the clock, right? But if they come by and they need something, I don't have a problem with that, right? I'm in your home, so I respect that I'm in your home, but I need to see you. If I don't see you, you're not engaged. And I will use myself as a perfect example. I learned early on in COVID, oh, this is great. I can multitask. No, I can't. No, I can't. If I'm not paying attention, like I'm sitting in a room at a meeting, I am not engaged. Mm -hmm. So I know what it feels like to be disengaged if my camera's not on or if I'm trying to multitask. Right. And I ask, and this is my lean in, right, to, to the workplace. This is where I say, please, if, if we trust and we would ever, let, let's try and find these um, strategies and examples to keep our culture as tight as we can. And I'll just come back last, that big word, trust. Trust, trust, trust. Don't try to measure the pound of salt in clicking, you know, clicking the clock. Is the work getting done? Are you productive? Is the product getting out? Is the service being delivered? Do you have satisfaction from those you serve? If so, it's work. I, I would just add, and I, I think that, and now I've, I've forgotten a little bit of the question, but I think, you know, one of the things that uh, we need to pay attention to in a hybrid and remote work environment is the, the laws still apply. Absolutely. And so sexual harassment can absolutely still occur, right? And discrimination. And so I think that's just something that, you know, we need to be aware of employees, uh, leaders and uh, employers need to just be aware of that, that just because you're not in sharing a space with someone doesn't mean that um, those behaviors, unfortunately, you know, can still occur. Right. Um, they just might manifest a little bit differently. 
Um, I agree with all this point, but uh, um, I often um, try to remind um, people in the public that we have, um, hybrid has changed the workplace uh, for the long term, for in the, in the professional, in the professional areas. But there's still people who have to go to work yeah, every day. Yeah. Yeah. Most people still yeah. have to go to work. Only about 30% of the workplace change mm -hmm. to a hybrid model. Most people still have to go to work and show up at a place. So when we do policy and we are thinking about policy and what the workplace needs, I think we sort of have to step out of our way of my own experience, a professional woman who has the choice to work from home. Most women do not. Mm -hmm. So we always have to like, you know, be, be uh, conscious about those differences. And so when we do that, then we have to think about what are the public policies needed when you are not a in, a in a professional relationship with your employer. For example, negotiating your wage, if you are a professional, you have that degree and you are going and you have an interview process and you can negotiate your wages. I totally I agree. I tell women all the time, um, know what the standard wage in your industry is. Know how much, how much uh, there's resources for uh, wages on the nonprofit sector that you can go to the library and download it and you know what the job categories and the wages are. So be informed. Mm -hmm. Don't tell them how much you're making now. You don't have to tell them so that they don't make you an offer just above it. That's empowering women professionals. But ma ma majority of women in, in, uh, that we talked about are stuck uh, when we struck the structural segmentation of the market is that they're stuck on jobs that they're per hour, the wage early, uh, wage hour job. Um, you know, even if you work in the logistics industry, which is the growing employer, right? Like the, the vessels of, uh, of Amazon of the world. Or if you're in retail, those are set wages by somebody else. There's no negotiation. So in that sense, that's where public policy is needed to set wages as standards. And that's why um, issues like the minimum wage are important because they raise uh, people's wages uh, in, in low wage industries and in, uh, in industries that you don't have the ability to negotiate your wages. So that's why the partnership between advocates uh, and uh, the business sector and the labor movement to, adva to advance policies that increase wages and earnings and working conditions is important as we continue to have to deal with hybrid schedules, but also with um, AI, you know, mm -hmm. artificial intelligence and how they set up technology to set up wages, I mean, to uh, schedules. That's a big problem in the healthcare industry mm -hmm. and in the logistics industry. They're using all this technology to set uh, schedules for, for people. And that's a big problem for women who they do not know in 24 hours what their work schedule is because it's set up to benefit the, the production schedule of the employer rather than to address the need of the worker. So those are dynamics that are happening in the workplace that we have to pay attention to. And that's why we at the Worker Institute focus a lot on what are the policy innovations needed to address the changes in the workforce and technology and AI is a big change that is coming that we have to figure out not only how it empowers professional women and professional workers, but also low wage workers uh, in our in, in our in our industries. Thank you. That's a very, very important point. Sure. So from an HR um, perspective, um, you know, when we when the pandemic um, hit, um, HR was forced very, uh, very quickly. Um, to you know, have to jump in and figure out a hybrid workplace, you know, for um, their organizations, whether they had single locations or multi locations, where they were global. Um, so it was very difficult because um, you know some HR professionals themselves had you know may never you know had 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 to work remote before. Um, they may have just always come to an office environment. So if you don't, if you've never actually um, done hybrid or remote. Um, how could you possibly, you know, try to um, teach and train others in it? Um, but nonetheless, a lot of HR um, professionals had to figure it out for their organizations. They were also um, tasked with um, developing policies, um, paying attention to the different laws, different things coming out from their local states, um, the federal government, CDC, um, different professional health organizations. Mm -hmm. And um, I would say that, you know, human resource professionals did an amazing job just given uh, the resources that they had and what just kind of fell on 
um, the world's lap, you know, as a result of the pandemic. But um, when you when we when we get to hybrid, we we definitely found that it was it was a big help for um, for women in particular, and but also, you know, people struggled, right? Because not everyone has a home, mm -hmm. it, you know, a, a, an office set up in their home or a private workspace where they could, you know, really get on and do a Zoom meeting or a Teams meeting. Um, or any other type of online platform meeting and they didn't want to, mm -hmm. right? So you struggle with people getting on, um, employees getting online, getting on time, getting on meetings on time. And during the pandemic, it was quite difficult to get on meetings on time because so many people were online, um, platforms were struggling, you know, to keep up with the demand. But, um, but also it's, you know, then having to, be forced to have the camera on because it's like, listen, I don't have a space in my, in my home. So, you know, it was very important to, you know, really have those conversations with people leaders to say, listen, we have to be flexible, right? Because so many people were having to be, you know, on video. So can we look at other ways for people to interact and engage, you know, the telephone didn't go anywhere, right? right? So and so one of the things, so you know, one of the things that I tell people all the time, listen, when I'm sending you a Zoom, the Zoom has a telephone line. So yeah. I will clearly tell you, please feel free to, to dial in or to jump on a video, whatever you like and whatever mm -hmm. works for you. And we have to be flexible with people, right? We have to be understanding. And like you all said, how many times were you on a meeting and the lawn people showed up just at the oh, right yeah, time <laughs> when you were the one speaking and the lawn service is going on in the background or the dog came in or the baby started crying. Like you would have, you would actually see some people leaders where that was annoying and they would kind of reprimand an employee for that. And you had mm -hmm. to step back and say, whoa, that's not, no, we, we have to be flexible because we're actually in a crisis here. We can't create another crisis. We don't want to create another crisis. We want to be um, compassionate, show empathy, um, and give people flexibility in different ways of showing up in this in this new environment that is very new for some people and for others it's not. You know, for me it wasn't it wasn't um, new for me. For some others it wasn't new for them, but for many it was very new. Um, and so, and for many we had to help others try to figure it out. And what um, I have always told organizations is you try different things. If it doesn't work, you figure out something else and you try that. But also don't try to figure it out on your, by yourself. Ask your employees what works for them, right? And, and try to be as flexible as you can um, where it's not a burden on, on the organization or, or your leaders but 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 try to be flexible. I certainly agree and, and certainly um, know that organizations found that while we went through this hybrid um, environment, we needed to get employees back together again. Mm -hmm. And that is important. I'm here to tell you it is important. Um, employees themselves who loved it in the beginning, they also, uh, many of them found that, you know what, I need that face-to-face -face interaction. And, you know, think outside of the box, you know, you don't necessarily have to bring employees back to the, to the um, office, but maybe you're, you're, you're doing something outside an outside activity where you're bringing people together. You're having meetings outside, you're going to a park, a course that may not be possible this particular summer because we're having such a hot summer, but um, you know, just think outside the box, different locations um, where you can bring together um, your, your, your staff together. You can do an activity. You can talk about things that are going on in the organization, um, continuing to set expectations and continuing to engage um, each other. Because as you all said, the law still does apply. It still does apply. And one of the things um, that HR was, was, was experiencing was that many people found that, hey, as we all know, a lot of people left New York City and New Jersey and, and they went out to, you know, other states, you know, primarily in states that were warmer mm -hmm. to do the work. And companies started to say, hey, well, 
should I still pay them their salaries, mm -hmm. the same salary that they're making? And yes, you absolutely um, should, because what we also found that was change. employees were working a lot harder mm -hmm. and longer, and a lot of companies profited from it, mm -hmm. you know? So, um, you know, again, the law still applies. Um, when, when things change, um, when, when a crisis happens, we have to consult, um, you know, legal counsel. Um, we have to have those conversations. And, and also, let's understand what best practices and next practices our, um, our, our competitors and other organizations and things that they're doing. Right. Let's ask the questions. Let's get together like we are in this roundtable and let's share one another amongst each other. While we have competitors, your competitors will oftentimes come together and share information. I like to call them frenemies um, <laughs> and, you know, but they do exist and they come together all the time to share best practices. But just know that you need to try different things. And if it doesn't work, just know that you can move on to the next things, but engage your employees bring them together and ask them what is working for them and try different things. And yes, hold you, you should still hold employees accountable, um, but we must continue to do the right things um, along the way. And, and, and we need to partner with the HR because um, there are a lot of great HR leaders out here, strong HR departments. Um, we need our CEOs to believe in us and see us as business partners. And many of them um, do for those who don't, you're missing out and you need to see your HR departments and leaders um, as business partners um, who are there to support and manage the organization as well as employees. Thank you. Thanks. Do you have anything to close well, out? With the I'm, on, I'm in the 70% of the businesses that can't, that don't have a hybrid mm -hmm. schedule. Mm -hmm. um, and I say can't because, you know, uh, schools were mandated to come back in session because yeah. we all know that children learn better, yeah. best once they're in the mm -hmm. classroom setting. Mm -hmm. um, so that whole department ha you know, has to come in. Mm -hmm. um, but, and we're still figuring it out. You know, we have some programs that absolutely people need to come in, want to, to see someone, if they need a case manager, they feel more comfortable. Mm -hmm. um, and so we have uh, been balancing what hybrid could look like. And then what does that look like in equity? Because it mm -hmm. may look like only certain work, you know, certain, some, certain um, positions and staff can work from home and others can. And what does that look like in an organization where we are trying to build equity? So it is something that we, we're so balancing. Um, and then for some, I just, the regu regulations that they have to be in person and I we can't do anything about yeah. that. <laughs> Yeah, and to that point, I will say the YWCA does have, we are a permanently hybrid workforce since we came back from um, being shut down during COVID. Um, and we do have school-based staff like you do as well that are not able to utilize that benefit. So we have created uh, an equity, you know, a equitable um, opportunity for those that they get additional time off um, because they are not able to access that hybrid. So as an employer, and, and, you know, a lot of what you heard, you know, in this conversation just now was kind of focused on what employers could do, but what those of you that are employees listening to this, I think what it really goes back to is some of the conversation earlier about you interviewing your employer when you're at the company and what you can advocate for, which everyone obviously so strongly talked about here. Um, it's important for you to know that these options exist in companies. And so you can talk to your HR professionals, talk to your supervisors, and when you're interviewing, ask these types of questions to make sure that you're going into a workplace that is supportive of you. Um, and as you know your rights too, then you obviously are able to navigate as well. So with that, you know, I'd like to bring us to close today. Um, this town hall discussion obviously was so had so much in it. And again, I'm so um, glad that it's it's memorialized and you can go back to it to get different pieces to it. Again, I encourage you if you're watching it and you think of someone else in your life that could utilize um, this information that you share it with them. Uh, I really just want to um, before I talk a little bit about the toolkit, thank all of our speakers. Um, for bringing their perspectives and their passion to this conversation and their creativity. Um, I heard at least four or five policies we probably could start to enact as well um, in these conversations. So um, there is more to do. And this is for sure a group uh, when, you know, obviously knowing that we have um, 
the Honorable Cindy Bayer at the, the helm at the, of Division on Civil Rights, you know, also working on our behalf, um, can all give us, you know, some comfort in terms of navigating these spaces for sure. Um, I really do want to call out the New Jersey State Bar Foundation. Um, I uh, encourage you to watch the videos and look at the toolkit. Um, uh, it, it is a uh, important resource. It could not have come together if that investment was not made, if this issue and supporting our employees in the workplace was not important to the New Jersey State Bar Foundation um, to be able to provide this that I know will help so many navigate troubled um, workplace experiences. So we are so grateful to them. Um, we will have the link to their website uh, in the comments for this um broadcast and I do encourage you to check about check more about their work and the other programs that they fund uh, lots of important information happening there and something that maybe you would like to consider supporting as well so with that I'd like to tell you a little bit about the toolkit itself um, it will be shared publicly um, shortly uh, at no cost anyone can access it it'll be available on our website at ywcannj.org we'll also be posting it periodically on our social media for those that can access it. Um, you know, what I have to say about a resource like this is you usually don't watch something like this until you're in a situation that you are having challenges and then you start Googling, looking for it. Um, we made this for those folks, but the great thing about knowing about it, if now you're aware of it, is you can have information that when someone comes to you and says, I'm having this trouble at work, you can say, hey, wait, I know this resource for you. So this is not only something that you can use, but taking the time to learn a little bit about it just gives you something for your own little toolbox, um, separate from the toolkit. Um, because, you know, we're all out there supporting many people in our circles and inevitably, statistically, from what we know about um, these workplace issues, it will impact either you or someone in your life for sure, and this will help them or you navigate it. So with that, the toolkit itself, you will find this recording from the Facebook Live Roundtable event that we've done today. Um, it also encompasses, as you heard, um, some educational videos. There were four of them that are created. They have a PSA format, um, and they highlight uh, different employee um, rights areas that are important. Uh, we covered many of them today, and you'll learn more about them in detail. You know, very often with these types of incidents that happen in the workplace, um, something's happening, but you're not entirely sure what it is or what to call it, or, you know, um, it just doesn't feel right. Um, these videos will help you put the words to it and help you know how to call it out and help you know how to uh, navigate next steps. Um, you will also find a link to all of our panelists here. Um, we did not take the time to go into their tremendous bios, but you will learn all about them on that toolkit. You will learn about the organizations and the businesses that they're connected to because they are all resources for you. And there's also a number of resources in addition, many that they've mentioned, many that they've shared with us, many that have come through um, KS Brannigan Law and others have pulled together for us. Um, so we do encourage you to, you know, it's all there packaged for you. You can take and use it when and if you need it. Um, I Again, this whole project was really inspired from the individuals that we have been working with in the community um, and you know, I can't tell you how many times someone comes and feels powerless mm -hmm. because of a situation mm -hmm. that yeah. has, you know, happened to them. Um, this is an opportunity to be able to take back that power because you now have knowledge, you now have potential actions that you can take, and, you know, it will help you be able to create a plan for yourself and how to navigate going forward in a way that keeps you safe. Um, most importantly. And so many of the things that might be a concern for you, we've discussed here today. And so hopefully that will give you a little bit of perspective to help navigating them when they come up for you as well. Um, we are so grateful that you took the time to join us here today. Um, again, please um, stay connected to the YWCA of Northern New Jersey. Um, you can do that through any of our social media platforms or visit our website. Uh, we, again, thank you for joining us and we wish you all a great day.